Okay, so I think we are now live. Uh, so welcome back everyone to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have a friend of mine, Jake Al Smith, speaking with us uh, today. Um, so I guess everyone knows the drill, but just in case we have any new viewers, um, we're going to have a kind of uninterrupted talk for sort of 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and then at the end, we'll have questions moderated by me. Um, so if you have any questions during the talk, then please just write them in the YouTube chat window um, and then we'll have a, a nice discussion at the end of the talk. Um, so yeah, we're really pleased to have um, Jake with us uh, today. Um, so Jake's just started a position at the University of Manchester. Um, he's an expert in kind of quantum optics and open quantum systems. Um, and one of his very kind of important contributions was um, the development of this reaction coordinate formalism for dealing with strongly coupled, strongly coupled open quantum systems. Um, and seeing as that's been of quite a kind of high interest topic for many of, of people in our community, I kind of asked Jake to give us a nice pedagogical introduction um, and some applications of this, this method. So uh, Jake, uh, really happy to have you and, and please go ahead. Uh, cheers, Mark. Um, so yeah, th thanks for giving me the opportunity to contribute to the, this series. So it's been great so far. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, two topics today. So the first is as how to describe open quantum systems in strong coupling regimes. And in particular, as Mark says, I'm going to be talk, uh, give an introduction to the collective coordinate or reaction coordinate formalism. And then I want to move on to how we can describe uh, non-additive environments using the collective coordinate mapping. Um, and I'll give a better definition of what non-additive means shortly. So the talk's going to be roughly divided into two parts. So I'm going to start by introducing the collective coordinate theory for describing strong coupling system, uh, system environment in strong coupling regimes. And the second, um, how we can describe multiple environments with the collective coordinate. Okay, so this is a picture we've seen a few times in the series so far. So um, essentially the, the context is open quantum systems. So we have some system described by Hilbert Space HS and it interacts with a many body environment HE with some interaction Hamiltonian HI. Um, now we really want to describe the reduced dynamics of this uh, system here when it's influenced by this interaction to a many body environment. So kind of a te textbook approach to this is through the master equation formalism. So essentially the idea here is to trace out the environmental degrees of freedom to get some reduced description of the dynamics of your system. So in the interaction picture, you can write a pretty simple equation for this, um, which is an integral differential equation for your reduced state of your system in terms of some integral over the interaction, pi interaction picture Hamiltonian and some global density operators. So this state here is a de description of both the system and the environment. Now, this is an exact expression. I've simply solved the von Neumann equation formally and resubstituted it in and traced over the environment degrees of freedom. So solving this expression here would be at least as hard as simply diagonalizing the system and environment Hamiltonian. So for most kind of environments of interest, this uh, solving this analytically or exactly is kind of intractable. So really to get a tractable um, description of our reduced system, we really want to find some ways of simplifying this mass, this equation in motion. Um, so a standard approach for doing that, well, there are three key approximations we can make to simplify this uh, equation. So the first is often referred to as the Born approximation, where we assume the system and environment factorize at all times. So this is essentially the assumption that our system is small and that it can't really influence the environmental state. So the system and environment remain in a product state throughout the evolution. The second uh, approximation is that we have some time local influence on the system. So the state of the system only depends on its current time. And this is very closely linked 
to this concept of an environment having no memory. So, or in other words, it's Markovian. So together, these are classed as the Born Markov approximations. If we plug this into our master equation, we can derive a, quite a simple um, form from the master equation where we can now do the, this uh, trace explicitly because we have a product state of the environment. And this is quite tractable in terms of actually solving, uh, solving things. So that's a very hand wavy explanation of the Born Markov approximation. Um, this can all be done very formally, and you can show through a projection operator approach that this master equation here is completely equivalent to a second order expansion of the interaction Hamiltonian HI. So the key point here is because it's a second order exp expansion in the interaction strength, we're restricted to regimes where the system and environment interactions are weak. And also importantly, because uh, of this product state assumption here, um, we're essentially neglecting any system and environment correlations. So this is a problem for open systems because we have many examples, both in quantum technology and nature, that you have some strong in interactions between system degrees of freedom and the environment. For example, in a quantum dot, we have uh, this blob of semiconductor where you get some localized excitonic states, and they couple very strongly to the vibrational modes of the host material. Uh, similarly, in color centers, you get some localized electronic states. They couple strongly to resonances in the um, crystal of the material. Uh, and in mole molecules, delocalized electronic states uh, couple to strongly vibrational modes, uh, a bending of this uh, molecule, and you can actually see signatures in the emission spectrum for these sharp peaks are direct signatures of vibronic states within the molecule. And also in both synthetic and natural um, molecular systems where you see that vibrational effects really influence how energy is transferred across complexes. So a common theme here is that the, the weak coupling theory that I just described in the previous slide is simply not sufficient to describe the dynamics of these um, systems. And so really we need some new approach to describe, to go beyond weak coupling and capture these strong coupling effects which are kind of inherent to many natural open quantum systems. So this isn't a new problem. Um, there are many approaches to actually try and cope with strong system environment coupling. So for example, we have a whole set of uh, numerical techniques such as hierarchical equations of motion, TDOPA, um, path integral techniques, and their uh, reformulation using matrix product operators, as well as some more analytic approaches such as pseudo modes and Polaron theory. So many of these techniques have, uh, are very good at certain regimes. Um, they most have limitations, uh, either scale poorly in certain limits, such as when you have strong non-Markovianity, you get some exponential scaling with the path integral methods. Um, so really, the approach I want to kind of advocate, I suppose, is this concept of being able to redraw boundaries in open systems. So if we return to our picture of an open quantum system, uh, we have we've essentially partitioned uh, our global system into a system, a part, and an environment. And we normally do this along physical ground, so we've got some atomic uh, degree of freedom, so some electronic states coupled to some vibrational modes, say, and that's where we draw a partition. But this is kind of arbitrary, um, so we could apply some unitary transformation to the global system and environment, and actually end up repartitioning uh, our system and environment into different parts. So we could define a new augmented system which contains some degrees of freedom of our ori original environment and a new residual environment um, which has all the excess modes. And hopefully if we choose B correctly, this map, then we can move to a frame where the new mapped interaction Hamiltonian is weaker than in the original frame. And this would allow us to derive some, uh, use a master equation formalism to derive uh, a second order perturbation theory essentially in regimes beyond weak coupling.
Okay, so you can think of this as finding an optimized basis to do perturbation theory. So there are a number of ways to do this. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the collective coordinate approach, where we take some system and we're going to keep this completely arbitrary. We don't really need to make a reference to the system. So we have some system interacting linearly with some bath of harmonic oscillators, described by these mode operators, and some system uh, operator S. The environment specified by the spectral density, which is essentially just the coupling strength weighted by the density of states of your environment. And this completely characterizes um, the, the behavior, the, both the interaction and behavior of the environment itself. Now, the collective coordinate mapping applies a unitary transformation to our system to extract a key degree of freedom, referred to as a collective coordinate, into a new augmented system, and then leaves a residual environment which is, with luck, um, weakly coupled to our new augmented system. So we'd now the idea would be to do perturbation theory on this augmented system and uh, trace out all the residual modes of the mapped environment. So to do this, we uh, define a new collective coordinate from this linear interaction term, where these A daggers and A's are functions of the old mode operators, and we have some new um, interaction strength, lambda. And the free part of the Hamiltonian um, is expanded in terms of this new mode operator, A dagger A, and it, we linearly couple to a new residual environment with the free evolution. So now we have three parts, so the augmented system, so we're going to try and treat this exactly to capture all the system environment correlations uh, with this collective coordinate. A residual environment, which captures all the uh, excess modes that aren't captured in this collective coordinate, and the linear interaction between this collective coordinate and the new residual environment. Okay, so to actually specify what this mapping will look like, we need to find three key parts. So the first is the interaction strength, lambda. The second is the mode splitting of our collective coordinate, omega. And the third is this residual spectral density. So this is a spectral density that describes the, the coupling to the residual environment. So to do this, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about how we do it, but rather just sketch uh, the process. So the first is to take a arbitrary system, which is just denoted by this dash box. So we really don't care what this system is, what it looks like, but we just want it linearly coupled to a bath of harmonic oscillators. So we can then derive a set of Heisenberg equations of motion. So we have Q hat, which is the essentially just the operator for our arbitrary quantum system here. Uh, undergoing some potential U and linearly coupled with this operator S to some bath of harmonic oscillators. And we can do the same with the bath operators. We get some, um, this is essentially just the position operator for the harmonic environment. And you can see that we get some Heisenberg equation uh, in terms of these mode operators. Okay, so then we can Fourier transform these equations of motion and solve everything formally in terms of uh, Q and some potential U on the right hand side, and you get this propagator K. So this propagator contains all the information of uh, how the environment couples to our uh, arbitrary quantum system. And actually you can write this in terms of spectral density by simply taking the limit of a real uh, Z parameter in K. So this is a, a procedure that was outlined by Garg in 85. Um, and in principle, it works for any open system. So that means we can repeat the procedure again for a collective coordinate type Hamiltonian, where again, we've replaced it with a collective, uh, with an arbitrary quantum system coupled to a collective coordinate, derive some Heisenberg equations, Fourier transform, and extract a spectral density. Now, the key point here is if we want 
the two uh, systems to be influenced by the same environment, though in slightly different representations, then this spectral density we extract through this procedure should be equal. Okay, so we can actually equate the spectral densities um, extracted through these two procedures um, and actually equate basically the, the parameters of the collective coordinate theory in terms of the spectral density of the original spin boson model or whatever this system is. Okay, so in principle this is kind of an arbitrary approach, um, but I'm going to basically highlight two key spectral densities where we know this uh, collective coordinate theory works well. So the first is an underdamped spectral density and the second is overdamped. Uh, and this is just to do with the sharpness of the peak in the spectral density. Uh, now, the, the, the expressions for both lambda and omega and the residual spectral density are slightly different in each case, but the common theme is that the coupling strength is proportional to the reorganization energy um, for both environments, or the square root of the reorganization energy. The mode frequency is proportional to where the peak of this spectral density lies. And then the residual spectral density has a simple ohmic form in both cases. Okay, so now we've specified our mapping, um, we can actually move on to describing the dynamics of our system. So to do that, we'll restrict ourselves to the special case of a spin boson model, where we have some splitting for a two-level system. Uh, it has some tunneling rate delta and some linear coupling to with a sigma z type coupling. Now we'll perturbatively eliminate the residual environments. So we're going to keep this augmented system, which is given by H prime in the unitary part of the master equation. And then the residual environment is included just through a dissipator. It's called KR here. So effectively what we're doing here is treating the augmented system to all orders of perturbation theory while taking the residual coupling to second order. What's really nice about this is it allows you to derive a nice second order master equation. Uh, it has, it's quite intuitive, easy to implement, um, but allows you to access very strong system environment coupling regimes. So to kind of highlight this, um, we can actually solve it for some overdamped um, spectral densities and compare it to hierarchical equations of motion, which converge to numerically exact results. And you can see this uh, solid curve matches perfectly with the hierarchy. And when you plot this hierarchy rather as points, but as a line, they really are indistinguishable. Now, just to highlight uh, that weak coupling theory would, in this regime, would um, predict just a simple exponential decay of the population, whereas you get this very strong oscillatory behavior in both the collective coordinate and hierarchy methods. Jake, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Do you mind? Um, I just wanted to, to mention that I think when you're moving your mouse, it's make, pick, getting picked up quite a lot by the mic. It's making quite a scratchy sound. So I was just wondering, oh, is, it? <laughs> is it possible to move the mic a little bit away from the mouse? Or uh, Yeah, I'll move the mouse away from the mic. Well, yeah, yeah, thanks, man. That, I think that'll solve it. That, that must have been very irritating. Sorry. Um, let's see if I can get a solution. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, we get some strong agreement between the hierarchy and the collective coordinate mapping, both at weaker and strong coupling regimes. And then when you turn to an underdamped case, um, you can see that, that you get some very complex dynamics in the collective coordinate, which matches the hierarchical equations of motion. And what's particularly nice about the collective coordinate in this situation is that you can see the frequencies that are modulated here uh, for the population dynamics correspond to almost exactly where the peak of the spectral density is and where the mode frequency of the collective coordinate. Okay, so, so it's kind of convincing that uh, you know, the, the reaction coordinate can recover population dynamics, uh, but one of the nice aspects of the collective coordinate, because we're treating this this part of the environment exactly, 
in, in, as an augmented system, we can actually access the system environment correlations. So if you look at the quantum mutual information, um, which is essentially just the difference of the, the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state of a two-level system and the reduced state of a reaction coordinate minus the total reduced state of the augmented system. Then through the sub additivity, strong subadditivity condition of the von Neumann entropy, what you can find is that this uh, reaction coordinate mutual information actually places a lower bound on the total correlations shared between the system and the original environment. So it gives us some direct insight into the kind of correlation shared between the two level system and the environment. So we can plot this as a function of time and you can see two quite distinct time scales. So at short times, you see this strong oscillatory behavior, which corresponds to the kind of strong non-Markovianity when you initialize a system and it relaxes to some equilibrium state. But then on a longer time scale, actually you can see the emergence of some steady state correlations. And this is emphasized at strong coupling. Um, so it's clear that there's kind of these competing time scales present and what you can see, if you plot the steady state uh, mutual information as a function of um, coupling strength, then you can see this emergence of uh, quite clear um, steady state correlations. So the, these correlations kind of are a bit puzzling if you take a weak coupling approach. So in a weak coupling theory, you would expect to thermalize to the canonical thermal state, uh, where essentially we have some exponential times the, the temperature times the system Hamiltonian. And there's no real reference to the system environment coupling strength. So with canonical thermal states, you'd expect only the temperature to be playing a role in determining the population difference and the state of the system. However, in our reaction coordinate theory, because we essentially have an augmented system, which we then treat in a weak coupling fashion, uh, then you expect to thermalize to the kind of augmented um, canonical thermal state where you have the, the temperature of your thermal bath um, times the, the Hamiltonian of the augmented system. So here you can see that the coupling strength to the, the original Hamiltonian enters directly into the, the, the steady state of our system. And this is kind of clear as you plot the population difference or the population ratio, sorry, as a function of coupling strength, you can see a strong change, which would be constant in a weak coupling theory. So the points here, again, are hierarchy. You see it agrees over all coupling strengths here. So that's kind of quite a neat trick in terms of the reaction coordinate where we can quite easily capture very strong coupling effects and in the steady state using a simple kind of a canonical formula. So actually this can be utilized in terms of uh, quantum thermo protocols. Uh, so by Dave Newman has a couple of papers on this where he uses um, this kind of non-canonical thermal state in uh, sort of strokes of a heat energy. Okay, so that kind of draws to the end of the first part of my talk. Hopefully uh, you followed so far. Um, now I want to go beyond just single environments and consider what happens to a, a quantum system when it interacts with multiple environments. So a generic system situation would be this, where we have a two-level system. It's interacting with two environments. So not only here do you have the correlations accumulated between the system and the, each environment individually, but mediated by the system, you'd also get correlation shared between both environments, which is denoted by this kind of blurring of the environments here. Now, unfortunately, this is a very complex situation um, because we need to track both the, the both system environment correlations as well as the interbath correlations. So a typical approach for dealing this is to kind of make what's called an additive approximation. So basically here, 
we construct the description of our two level system by uh, of our system environment interaction by neglecting one of the environments first. Uh, so say we neglect H2, we can derive a quantum channel that describes the influence of H1 on our system. And then we can do the opposite, we can neglect uh, H2, H1 and derive the channel for H2. And an additive approach would be then to say, okay, the reduced state of the environment, uh, of a system, sorry, um, is influenced by basically the sum of the two contributions. So this is essentially assuming that each environment acts on the system in a mutually exclusive fashion. So this is problematic uh, in certain systems, and I want to give a very concrete example of where this breaks down. And that's of a two-level system interacting with a single vibrational mode. Okay, so uh, we have a ground and excited state with some energy splitting epsilon, and it's interacting uh, with some vibrational mode described by omega, with a splitting omega. Um, so this mode is going to be replaced with the reaction coordinate shortly, but if we just imagine a vibrational mode at the moment. And it has a very simple uh, Hamiltonian, um, where rather than a sigma z type operator, we have uh, just the projector onto the um, excited electronic state. So now we're going to assume that these two, uh, if we diagonalize this um, Hamiltonian, then we get this um, quite nice picture where you have a, a manifold. Uh, Do you know where we lost? Say again? Do you know where we... Uh, Got cut off. Um, I'd say maybe go. But I'm not ent entirely sure, but I'd say maybe it's I'll, worth. I'll start on this slide. Going okay. back a slide. Okay, so sorry about that, everyone. Uh, my computer weirdly froze while still continuing to work somehow. So some kind of quantum paradox there. But I hope that we are now back live. Um, so we'll try and go back to the the slide where. So maybe. I mean, I I think we were probably okay up to to the description of. Um, this kind of Hamiltonian. So okay. Maybe if you can just take it from, from there, Jay. Yeah, I'll, ta I'll take it from the slide then. Um, yeah, okay, so so the, the setup is basically a two-level emitter. It's coupled to a single harmonic oscillator using a standard kind of electron phonon interaction term. And if you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, then you end up with this kind of displaced picture where the ground state is left unchanged. You have just a simple a harmonic oscillator uh, with the electronic ground state, but then the excited state has a vibrational mode which is displaced. So the question um, we want to ask is how what what determines the emission rate from this excited state manifold to the ground state? So we can do this using Fermi's golden rule. Um, where you just have a simple expression for the transition rate from excited to ground. And it has three main components. So the first is the optical spectral density. So this describes the coupling between a dipole and the optical density of states. Uh, and in, in it, you can see that we're sampling the spectral density at not only the electronic splitting, but also the difference between the starting vibronic state, so we're going to start in a state M and end in a state N in the ground state. So it's the kind of the difference in the, these two energies. Second component is a Gibbs distribution, so we assume that the mode starts in thermal equilibrium, so that the population is distributed across this excited state manifold. And the third contribution is that of the Frank Condon factor. So this is essentially just the overlap between the different vibrational states. So because these two wells are displaced, uh, the, the vibrational states are no longer orthogonal, which means you can you have some non-trivial overlap between this this uh, first state in the lower well and every single state in the lower manifold. Okay, so this is kind of a, a standard expression in molecular physics and spectroscopy. So what happens if we try to make an additive treatment? So in an additive approach, essentially, uh, hopefully you can get cut off in the previous slide, um, 
the idea is that you treat each environment individually. So I'm going to treat my optical coupling uh, independent of my vibrational coupling. So that means I sample my spectral density only at the electronic splitting. So if you look at this expression, so we can pull our um, optical spectral density outside the sum, and what we're left with is essentially a resolution of the identity here, and the rest of this sum essentially becomes one. So we see that the, the decay rate from the excited state manifold to the ground state in an additive treatment is completely independent of the electron phonon coupling. So this is kind of in direct contradiction to the Frank Conan, uh, fact, Frank Conan principle, um, which, as I say, underlines most of uh, molecular spectroscopy. Uh, so it's clearly there is an issue here, um, even despite it being slightly convoluted uh, analogy. So to kind of move back to an open systems picture, we can put this on a more microscopic footing. Uh, we have and consider the dynamics. So we have a two-level system. Again, it has some splitting epsilon. It couples to a bath of harmonic oscillators described as a sum over some continuum. No, not a continuum in this case, but um, continuous degrees of freedom um, and some electromagnetic field. So if we apply, uh, apply our reaction coordinate uh, mapping here, then we can extract an augmented system, uh, again, where we have a single collective coordinate representing the phonon bath and a linear coupling to a residual degrees of freedom. And also it noticed that the coupling to the uh, electromagnetic field is no longer changed by this reaction coordinate mapping. So since the mapping only acts on the modes of our uh, phonon environment, there's no impact to the electromagnetic field. Okay, so we're going to take for the, the rest of these plots an underdamped spectral density. So now we're faced with the question is how do we describe the dynamics of our electromagnetic field? So if we derive a master equation, it has exactly the same form um, for the augmented system uh, in the reaction coordinate, also the dissipator to the residual phonon environment, but now we have to decide what we're going to do with the electromagnetic dissipator. So a standard approach would be to take an additive strategy where we derive the master equation in the absence of the phonons and the result will be just a simple Lindblad style dissipator. So this is exactly the same as simply tacking on um, Lindblad, uh, Lindblad terms to your master equation. A non-additive theory, on the other hand, would uh, we can diagonalize our augmented system Hamiltonian and derive a master equation for the electromagnetic field in this um, eigenstructure, eigenstates. So essentially this means that our KEM will respect the eigenstructure of our augmented system. And if you look at the dynamics now, so this is essentially just the population as a function of time, then an additive theory, which is given by the dash curve, doesn't change at all with increasing coupling strength and actually matches a situation when we have no phonons at all, these dots, um, perfectly. The non-additive theory, on the other hand, actually sees a reduction in the decay rate as you increase um, the electron phonon coupling strength. So essentially what's happening here is that we're, as we increase the electron phonon coupling strength, we're increasing this displacement. So the potential well moves further away from uh, the ground state manifold, and there's a reduced overlap between states in this well and this well. So we get some kind of localization effect. So again, we see that the, the additive theory, even at the master equation level, um, doesn't really respect the Frank Condon principle. And we can go further and think what happens, well, what happens when we increase the temperature of the optical field. So typically you'd see um, in just a two level system, you'll see the, the field begin to drive transitions between the ground and excited state. Um, importantly, for a two-level system, though, you'd never see a population inversion. Um, and as you can see by this dashed curve, 
Um, this is the additive theory. As you increase the temperature, uh, you see the population of the excited state increase, but it never quite reaches a population inversion. And that's because you've got, only got two states to access. And that's the case in the additive theory as well. The non-additive theory, on the other hand, now the optical field is sensitive to the full eigenstructure of your um, vibronic states. So now when we drive a transition, we can access all these uh, this manifold of vibrational states. And this allows you to um, kind of generate a population version at extremely large coupling strengths. So it's kind of clear that a non-additive treatment can lead to some very different um, physical phenomena over a simple additive treatment. Um, so I don't know whether that was fast or slow, but uh, that kind of brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so the reaction coordinate seems to be a very good tool for describing uh, strong coupling and non-Markovian effects. It allows you to gain direct insight into steady state correlations. And also access regimes uh, in terms of not additive effects. So we're able to see some quite surprising phenomena when we account for coupling to multiple environments using this collective coordinate. So with that, um, yeah, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Essen and Henry, who worked on the reaction coordinate side with me, um, and also Neil and Erend, who generated the hierarchy data. Uh, so, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Jake. Uh, that was really good. Um, so we have time, plenty of time for questions, guys. Um, and we already have several questions, actually, already from the audience. But anyone else uh, who has any questions, please just go ahead and, and write them in the YouTube chat. Um, so, OK, let me just go through the, the questions and, and kind of comments. Um, I'll just bring my video back. So you can see me. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so I think the first question we had was uh, was from um, Vera Sigal, um, and actually Archak uh, also had a sim. Archak Pukayas that also had a, a similar question. So so Vera asks, how do you set the initial condition for the collective coordinate in comparison to the original model? And then sort of in a follow up comment, Archak sort of says, in deriving results of the original setup, the initial condition is usually a product of system and bath. But in driving the, co the collective coordinate, the system would involve the auxiliary mode, so a different initial state. Yeah, so, so essentially we assume that the initial condition for the reaction coordinate is a thermal state set at the same temperature as the original spin boson Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's in a product state. Um, and that seems to work extremely well. Um, and I think the reason for that is that the, the coupling to this augmented system, which would be the, the kind of residual modes, is extremely weak. Um, and that, that's why the, the reaction coordinate master equation works uh, well. So that allows you to say, OK, well, we're in a product state with not only with the two level system, collective coordinate, but also with the, the residual environment. I see. I, I presume, though, that that sort of depends a little bit on the spectral density of the bath, right? I mean, in some cases, you wouldn't necessarily expect the residual coupling to be weak. Yeah, like, is that... so I should say that it's very, very particular to um, these spectral densities. And I imagine that there are, um, well, there will be situations where that's not a good approximation. Um, but I think those regimes would be when you're coupling between the collective coordinate and this residual environment is strong. Yeah, right, I see, indeed. Um, okay, thanks. Um, okay, so um, next question from Jun Jie Liu. Um, so the question, regarding this non-additivity of multiple environments, uh, is it because you adopt the quantum master equation um, and I think, okay, there's a follow-up comment from him, I guess, which is related to the same thing. Um, if one just looks at the Heisenberg equation of motion for system operators, the contributions from different environments are still additive. So certainly the, this idea of adding the two channels together, um, that, that is naturally additive. Um, so 
essentially just adding dissipates to a master equation is equivalent to doing an additive theory. With regard to the Heisenberg equations, I think this would naturally be non-additive up until you start factorizing correlation functions. Where, where essentially you'll be limiting any correlations that can be accumulated between the two environments. But at, at some point, if you if you have a complex, you know, uh, quantum system coupled to multiple environments, then at some point that is a step you're going to have to take to to actually calculate anything. So I can't I can't say anything any more definite than that. I don't think, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I guess my take on this would be, I mean, the, the non-additivity comes in once you start taking averages over something, right? So in the master equation, you're basically averaging over the bath. And I mean, additivity comes about if you assume some kind of factorized, I mean, one way it can come about anyway is if you assume some kind of absence of correlations between the baths, right? I mean, the Heisenberg equations don't know anything about the state, they just know about the operator equations. But as soon as you start taking averages, then you would expect to see correlations between different bath variables, right? Yeah, and as soon as you want to calculate anything, you'll, you'll at some level, you'll either build a hierarchy of Heisenberg equations. At some level, you'll have to terminate that by factorizing. So it could it could be that you could include non-additive effects in kind of a controlled way by tuning where you terminate that hierarchy. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so next question. Um, so the next question uh, is from um, Brecht Donville, um, who asks, is it correct that the reaction coordinate is valid only at high temperatures? The steady state graphs seem to start deviating from hierarchical, uh, hierarchical equations of motion at higher temperatures. Yeah, uh, short answer is it is correct. But it's valid for high temperatures. Um, at low temperatures, yeah, you begin to see slight deviations. Uh, the reason for this is that, again, we're, we're assuming weak coupling between the collective core, well, the augmented system and this residual environment. So at low temperatures, the correlation function for the residual environment becomes long lived, and we enter a regime where actually you're going to start getting non-Markovian interactions between the, the residual environment and the, the augmented system. So, so yeah, that's where, that's where we begin to see a breakdown. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and we have um, another question from Vera Segal, uh, who says, thanks. Um, how do you, in practice, include the collective coordinate? I assume you truncate the vibrational mode. Are you limited then to high frequency modes and relatively low temperature? Um, so, as I say, that, that that's exactly what we do. We uh, choose a dimension of our Hilbert space for our mode, and then propagate the master equation. The high temperature. So I've just said we we're, we we're at high temperatures. So the difference is that the mode frequency is sufficiently big that you can go to high temperatures without getting extremely high occupations of the bonum modes. But as you get sort of smaller omega, smaller um, splittings in your collective coordinate, things do become more computationally challenging. But, you know, sparse matrices and patients, you can push the system quite, quite big. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, and we have another question from Archak. So you can see the people, the keen beans in the audience. Um, so Archak says, thanks. Uh, another question. Uh, a reaction coordinate mapping would not usually give weak coupling to a residual environment. Do we know under which conditions the residual coupling will be weak? Um, I'm not sure I can give you a general statement here. What I will say is the reaction coordinate seems to work very well when you have strongly peaked spectral densities. So in the under, under damp case, we have quite a nice, like almost Lorentzian peak uh, centered here. And also the under damp case, um, it's very sharply peaked. You know, this is looking an awful lot like a single Lorentzian. 
so that, that would suggest that a single Lorentzian would be a good approximation for your path. General statement, it's quite hard uh, to say. Um, we're kind of actively trying to look into this, um, but the mappings become slightly more complicated. So I will say that the, the for the, the reason I'm looking at under, overdamped and underdamped cases is that the mapping is extremely straightforward and we can get analytic forms for both the coupling strength and the mode frequency. That's not always the case. Great, uh, thanks very much. Um, so um, if we have any more questions, guys, feel free to write them in. Um, I'm just going to ask something that I was kind of wondering about. I mean, this is related to actually to Devira and Archak's previous question. So um, if you did want to kind of incorporate, I mean, let, let's say that you really want there to be a product initial condition between the, the system and the original bath in the kind of untransformed frame, how feasible is is this to actually incorporate i mean is this even possible or is it just sort of difficult to do it hence why you don't do it um okay well as a general point so the, if you have an initial thermal state it's essentially just an exponential of this term in your on hamilton so this mapping is there's a unitary transformation, so you can essentially just transform this term in the exponential in terms of this linear coupling. So the question is how how do you deal with this object? Um, so the reason the weak coupling kind of at least my intuition, if this coupling term is weak, then you can imagine a zero order pertur perturbation perturbative expansion will just be a product of a, a a thermal state with this term and this term. Uh, so I imagine you could generate some kind of perturbative series to kind of push beyond the weak coupling regime. Uh, but I don't think it's a. I don't think it's trivial to kind of uh, get a closed form for just the initial condition for the reaction coordinate. Certainly, you'd have correlations between your collective coordinate and the residual environment. It, which master equations don't deal with so well. You do get some quite funny behavior, but it's not impossible. Okay, thanks, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, so I think that's probably it for the questions. Uh, we also have lots of clapping and thank yous from the audience, by the way, so I just relay those oh. to you. Um, and um, yeah, I think we'll... Um, We'll conclude it there. So thanks very much to everyone once again for tuning in and joining us. Um, we'll be back again on Friday. I'll have a notification about that soon. Uh, and in particular, thanks so much, Jake, for giving us such a nice pedagogical talk. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. Cheers. <laughs>